90 seconds after launch in April 2012, this North Korean rocket exploded. It was the latest in a string of disappointments for Pyongyang's fledgling space program. Eight months later, a different story. A North Korean observation satellite reportedly made orbit. Two of the scientists behind that launch deny claims from Western observers the satellite was damaged, essentially becoming space junk. In September 2023, North Korea's dictator Kim Jong-un rolled into Russia for a face-to-face -face with Vladimir Putin. And the reason was no shock. Russia, neck deep in its war with Ukraine, was hunting for allies, and North Korea was one of the few still willing to shake their hand. But here's the twist. This wasn't in Moscow. Kim met Putin at the Vostokny Cosmodrome, a flashy modern spaceport in eastern Russia, home to the mighty Soyuz rockets. Fast forward one year to fall 2024, and suddenly North Korean soldiers are spotted on Ukraine's front lines. Nobody sends troops halfway across the world for free, so it's crystal clear what Kim's chasing in return. The man's obsessed with rockets, U.S. President Donald Trump even branded him Little Rocket Man, and Kim wore that nickname like a badge of honor. But here's the thing. This rocket addiction didn't start with him. It's a family tradition. Back around 1980, under his grandfather Kim Il-sung, North Korea kicked off its first space program, aiming to build satellites and homegrown rocket tech. They even built their first launch site, Tongyi, on the northeastern coast. By 1985, the place was basically a symbolic prop. Just a lonely launch pad and a bunker. More for show than real action. Then, the mid-90s hit. Kim Il-sung dies, and his son Kim Jong-il slides into power. And that's when things start to heat up. He rolls out his so-called three pillars of power and prosperity, setting the stage for a new chapter in North Korea's space race dreams. Science and tech. That's one of Kim Jong-il's big three pillars, with ideology and military muscle making up the rest. By the mid-90s, the Tonghai spaceport gets a serious glow-up, quadrupling in size with a rocket assembly plant, fuel storage tanks, and ground tracking systems. At the same time, crews break ground on a second launch site, Sohai. This one's up on the northwestern coast, way closer to Pyongyang and even closer to China making it prime territory for quick access and secrecy. Yeah, the build is slow, but Sohai doesn't stay small for long. It eventually becomes a beast, five times bigger than Tonghei, rocking its own engine test site and a slick mission control center worthy of a movie set. But a shiny spaceport means nothing without a rocket to launch. And here's where North Korea's story takes a turn that ties back to one of the darkest chapters in modern history. Like every other space program, North Korea's rocket tech grew straight out of long-range ballistic missile designs, and that path leads right back to Nazi Germany in World War II. A German scientist named Werner von Braun built the infamous V-2 missile, a deadly weapon that could soar beyond the atmosphere before slamming into cities with devastating force. After the war, von Braun jumped ship to the U.S., where he became NASA's rocket mastermind. Meanwhile, the Soviets scooped up the next best thing, the V-2 blueprints and leftover rocket parts. They rolled out their own version, the R-1, then upgraded it into the R-11, better known worldwide as the Scud missile. The Scud became the most traded ballistic missile on Earth, with around 7,000 pumped out during the Cold War, spreading from the Middle East to North Africa until you could find one almost anywhere. It took a minute before the Scud found its way into North Korea. They weren't exactly best buddies with the Soviets. Instead, it was Egypt that hooked them up, sending over their first ballistic missiles as a thank you for North Korea's support during the Yom Kippur War against Israel back in the early 70s. Now, just like countless nations before them, North Korea suddenly had the power to strike from far, far away, and they loved it. The Kim regime became notorious for those over-the-top military parades in Pyongyang, rolling massive missile launchers past cheering crowds. But of course, once you've got missiles, the next step is to make them even bigger, stronger, and scarier. Here's the kicker. A giant missile and a satellite rocket? 
pretty much the same thing. So if you're gonna build one, you might as well do both. A space program isn't just science, it's a statement, a show of strength. And if there's one thing the North Korean leadership lives for, it's flexing hard on the world stage. By August 1998, the Kims had officially thrown their hat in the space race. Their first homegrown orbital rocket, the Tai Podong, was rolled out to the Tonghai launch pad. Basically, it was a supersized scud with a little extra punch. Against the odds, it blasted off and climbed to about 200 kilometers high. North Korea bragged that they had put their first satellite into orbit, but Western experts weren't buying it. Sure, it reached space, but it never locked into a stable orbit. That first satellite in 98? Yeah. It probably just fell back to Earth a couple days later. And North Korea wouldn't try again for nine long years. This time, they rolled out a new toy, the Unha, meaning galaxy in Korean. It was basically a beefed-up version of their old rocket, but now powerful enough to make the United Nations nervous. The UN warned them to cancel the launch, calling it way too close to an intercontinental ballistic missile for comfort. Even Russia told Kim Jong-il to chill, but he ignored them. In April 2009, the Unha blasted off, hit space, and once again, North Korea boasted about putting a satellite into orbit. But Western trackers called it a flop, claiming it never made it to a stable orbit and its debris splashed down in the Pacific. This is where Kim Jong-un steps into the spotlight, just a year after his father's death in 2011, Little Rocket Man was already cranking up the pressure to supercharge North Korea's space program. By April 2012, we saw the first ever launch from the brand new Sohei spaceport, another UNA rocket. But instead of glory, it went boom, exploding mid-air right after liftoff. And this was supposed to be a grand tribute for Kim Il-sung's 100th birthday. Embarrassing? Sure. But Kim Jong-un didn't back down, he doubled down. By December 2012, North Korea was back on the launch pad for round two, and this time, it worked. The Unha successfully placed their first satellite into a sun-synchronous orbit about 500 kilometers high, proving that they could finally pull it off. The satellite they launched in 2012 North Korean media bragged it was already spying on American military bases, but astronomers watching from the ground said otherwise. Sure, it was in orbit, but tumbling so wildly it couldn't spy on a parked car, let alone a military installation. The UN wasn't buying North Korea's peaceful space story, either. In 2013, they slapped the country with fresh sanctions, pushing it into even deeper isolation. Then. In February of that same year, North Korea pulled off an underground nuclear test, and by year's end, Kim Jong-un had ordered the assassination of his own uncle. With all that chaos, satellite launches slid to the back burner for a while. It wasn't until February 2016 that the Unha roared back to life, timed perfectly to honor what would have been Kim Jong-il's 75th birthday. This time, it was the real deal. A flawless launch that placed another Earth observation satellite into a sun-synchronous orbit. This one could actually beam photos back to Earth, marking North Korea's first truly successful space mission. But the momentum didn't last. The program went quiet again, with Western intelligence hinting that Pyongyang was cooking up a new, more advanced rocket, though progress seemed glacial. Then came 2023, the year the whole game changed. Kim Jong-un met Vladimir Putin at a Russian spaceport, sealing a deal that would send North Korean troops to help Russia's war in Ukraine. But here's the real question. Was this meeting about exploring space? Or was it Kim quietly gearing up for World War III? Honestly? It's both. And that's exactly how it's always gone down. The Soviet Union didn't kick off by dreaming about space capsules and moon landings. They were cranking out massive intercontinental ballistic missiles and nuclear warheads built for one reason, to wipe the United States off the map. But if that fiery doomsday never comes, you can't just toss all that tech in the trash. 
so why not turn it into a space program and still look powerful doing it? Fast forward to May 2023. North Korea unveils its brand new rocket, the Chalama, named after a mythical Korean horse symbolizing speed and power. This wasn't just an upgraded Unha, it was a whole different beast. No longer based on the old Scud missile, but not exactly an original North Korean creation either. Because its first stage booster? It looked very similar to the Soviet RD-250, a dual-nozzle rocket engine designed in the mid-1960s. How a batch of surplus Soviet rocket engines ended up in Pyongyang is a mystery on paper. But let's be real. It doesn't take a wild imagination to figure it out. On Cholima's first launch, the booster stage worked like a dream, but the second stage failed to even light, sending the whole thing crashing into the ocean. When they tried again in August 2023, the first and second stages ran smooth. But the third stage engine sputtered out during the orbital insertion burn. That means, we can pretty much conclude this. North Korea's new rocket runs on reliable Soviet hardware for the heavy lifting. But once it switches to their own upper stage tech, things get dicey. North Korean media blamed those upper stage flops on a new engine with an unstable fuel type. Nobody really knows what that's supposed to mean. But it sounds like they were testing some original homegrown design, and it just wasn't cutting it. Then came November 2023, the third Chalama launch. And finally, everything clicked. All three stages fired flawlessly, and a shiny new military spy satellite was slipped into a sun-synchronous orbit. This was just two months after Kim's closed-door meeting with Putin. And suddenly, their rocket headaches were gone. Something clearly shifted because by May 2024, a completely new rocket was sitting on the Sohei launch pad. And this thing was a huge leap forward. In just one year, they'd gone from struggling upper stages to a rocket running on cryogenic liquid oxygen and kerosene, the same kind of fuel used in a SpaceX Falcon 9 or a Russian Soyuz. Not cutting edge, but absolutely standard for modern spaceflight. And let's be honest, you don't have to think too hard about how North Korea got that upgrade so fast. But just because they got their hands on the tech doesn't mean they instantly became world-class rocket scientists. The new bird barely cleared the pad before exploding in mid-air, seconds after liftoff. No name, no mission details, nothing. The secrecy was thicker than ever. And that's saying something for North Korea. It's not shocking, though. Cryogenic rockets are a whole different beast. Liquid oxygen has to be stored at below minus 100 degrees Celsius. And when that super chilled propellant slams into a hot engine, the sudden temperature swing can wreak havoc on the entire fuel delivery system. One tiny flaw and the whole thing blows. The real shock? They haven't tried again since that explosion, but don't think for a second they've given up. Satellite shots from June 2025 show a massive rocket engine test at Sohei, the first since summer 2024. On top of that, there's fresh construction at the site, an expanded factory that cranks out rocket engines, and even a brand new tunnel linking the launch pad to a nearby rail line. Translation? Kim Jong-un is definitely cooking something up, and he's not the only one stirring the pot. Whatever's coming next could change the game in ways nobody's ready for. If you want to know where this story is headed, Make sure you subscribe, like, share, and drop a comment, because the next chapter might be the wildest yet.